Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. Um, on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association, I welcome you to today's Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. I am um, the former president of the USA chapter. I, am, I own an online learning company called Humanist Learning Systems. And welcome. And my co-host is Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Elizabeth Castillo, the current president of the USA chapter of the Humanistic Management Association. And um, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, Sarah, we're really excited to hear your uh, talk. Thank you. All right. And our guest is Sarah Radican, Dr. Sarah Radican. Um, she is, where, where's your bio? Okay, here we go. She has a DBA, an MBA, an MSML, BA, CSSGB, CHO. She's a seasoned expert in human resources and organizational effectiveness with over two decades of experience. Her professional journey began in the U.S. Navy, setting the stage for her lifelong commitment to teamwork, discipline, and effective communication. Throughout her career, she's held key roles in various sectors, always focusing on enhancing employee well-being and organizational culture. And she's a delightful person to speak to. So welcome, Sarah. We're really excited to hear what you have to say about the concept of organizational inflammation and how to use a humanistic approach to combat misery and boost productivity. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jen. And in full disclosure, hi, I'm Sarah Radican, and I'm also the secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association. So I wanted to make sure that that relationship was disclosed. Uh, but I'm really excited about this topic. So I'm going to try to share some slides here and we will get this kicked off. And the goal here is really to do just a little bit of conversation around the concept of organizational inflammation and what it means and how to apply the framework. And then also for us to be able to uh, have a conversation, right? This isn't me on a stage talking to you because you don't know anything. I think there's always something to be learned from these conversations. So when I think about organizational inflammation, right? What does that actually mean? I know a lot of people have questions about that. So this concept was actually born when I was working for a company that did animal health. And people really struggled to understand the human impact of weird policies or friction between it, between employees or just anything that was diverting energy from the organizational mission, right? So to think about this, company is actually a lot like a living organism, right? An animal or a human has lots of interconnected systems, all of which play unique roles and all of which depend on each other for full functionality. We would be pretty inefficient as humans if we did not have a scalable system. And our skeletal system is pretty useless without a nervous system, circulatory system, et cetera. Companies are exactly the same way. Companies have lots of different departments, right? And we all know this, we've worked in various organizations. They have human resources, they have an R&D department or a sales department, or um, in, a, in a university, you have your, your deans and you have the different colleges and then you have the admin side of things that help manage. So there are, and there's of course the finance department that nobody likes working with, but is super important for the overall functionality of the team. And all of these departments depend on each other to be able to do their best work. And sometimes something happens that creates friction and that, that something can be any number of things, right? It could be that policies or procedures that were drafted are no longer effective. It could be that the policies uh, no longer match regulatory landscape. It could be that culture and society have changed and the way things have always been done, no longer serves the people or the company well. It could be any number of things, but anytime something gets out of whack, out of alignment, we start to see these friction points develop. And so if you think about what that looks like from an organizational perspective, what that starts to, how the symptoms of that are things like lower productivity, higher absenteeism, increased turnover, uh, friction between individuals, tension on teams, just any number of symptoms that really make life unpleasant. And so I came into the scene because I was recognizing there were patterns of this behavior that were happening, right? And 
uh, organizations that I was working with were seeing some of the symptoms that you see here on the screen. And this is research that came out of the American Psychological Association just last year. Actually, this year is when they published it. And I'm not going to go through all of these points because I think they're relevant and they're valid data points. And you have seen these in your organization. But this is just sort of a, a list of some of the challenges that people start to see when employee engagement is taking a hit, right? So emotional exhaustion shows up. Burnout, we all know burnout is a raging problem within our organizations. I currently work in a healthcare industry and the nursing shortage is catastrophic and really scary, quite honestly, and it's due to things like burnout and exhaustion. People just aren't motivated. Quiet quitting, right, was a trend that came out and is a problem. Not in necessarily the ways people think of it, but I think that it's a symptom of people feeling abandoned or feeling not cared for or supported by their organization. We are also seeing uh, people just simply not wanting to do their job. And we have an environment in most countries around the globe, actually, where people have more flexibility than they have historically had. So when people cease to be engaged in the work that they're doing and they start to cast their net outside of their current environment, not only do you lose their connection in the moment, but the minute they walk out the door, you also lose their institutional knowledge. You lose the cohesive relationships that help lubricate the work that's happening. And that that is all super duper problematic for organizations. And it's not just that these are like topics to talk about. There is a real dollar amount associated with this. So the most recent estimate from the Gallup organization is that employee disengagement is not only at a really horrible rate, uh, two thirds of employees globally aren't excited to be at work and about 15 to 18% are actively disengaged, which means they are sabotaging their organizations, they are poisoning the well within their team, they are trash talking their company and helping uh, helping raise those turnover numbers, and the dollar amount associated with this is catastrophic. So Gallup estimates that globally, globally, the economy takes an $8.8 .8 trillion hit every single year. The U.S. sees about a half trillion dollars just within our economy alone. So I know a lot of people say, well, how do I start to have this conversation with my leadership? And the truth is, if your leadership is not super excited about just being good people and taking care of their teams, they certainly are going to be interested in the fact that they are leaving a ridiculous amount of money on the table just from employee disengagement alone. <laughs> so how do we fix this stuff, right? Like this is, this is real world problematic stuff. Uh, there are two really two ways that I have seen within the research, both my own research and others, to start to reverse the effects of this organizational inflammation. And they are a more positive mindset. I know that sounds Pollyannish, but bear with me. And including more gratitude, active gratitude within our daily working environments. So positive mindset is it's easier said than done, I think, because much of our culture is designed to keep us unhappy. I am cynical enough to realize that when people are unhappy, they are easier to control and they are more likely to go engage in retail therapy. So I recognize that uh, there are, is a incentive to keep people unhappy. From a humanistic perspective and from a human caring perspective, I think that's trash. I think that we we all deserve to live our best lives, whatever that means for us. And we'll talk about happiness here in a minute. But positivity and gratitude help us start to decrease or they act as like a, an anti-inflammatory treatment for all of those frictions that happen in our environment. And here's how. So the human brain is hardwired, hardwired biologically for negativity bias. It's literally a survival mechanism. It is how we avoid getting run over by vehicles. It's how we avoid getting eaten by saber-toothed tigers. So we are, we are biologically geared towards looking at the negative things that are happening in our environment. And don't get me wrong, there is a lot to focus on if that's what you want to do. 
And I am not suggesting, I would never suggest that we should shut off our awareness of the dangers in our environments, physical, emotional, psychological, political, career dangers in our environment. Those are all things that are well worth being aware of. And they are not the only thing going on. The human brain, re scientists estimate the human brain processes about 34 gigabytes of information every single day. And I can promise you that statistically within that 34 gigabytes, there are a couple of blips, if not more, of things that are positive, joy-inducing, gratitude-worthy, and so on. So when we start to retrain our brains to look for the good in our environment, we are really starting to combat that biological desire to just focus on the bad. Uh, you know, I believe that we have wrinkly brains for a reason, and that means we can think beyond our survival instincts. And we all see the impact of stress all around us. We're probably all dealing with the impact of stress ourselves, no matter how good our personal stress management techniques are. So positive mindset really helps us start to reshape how we approach the world at large by focusing on positive things in our environment. And gratitude is an incredibly powerful tool. When I was doing my doctoral research on gratitude and I was presenting the research I had gathered and put together, there was this really long pause. And anybody who's done uh, graduate work knows that a long pause from a committee is usually a little uh, nerve wracking. And finally, the gentleman said, I don't understand why we stopped saying thank you to each other. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. We can have this conversation, right? But the truth is we have stopped saying thank you in ways that are meaningful. And gratitude is, is a really interesting biological interaction. So when we acknowledge that we are experiencing gratitude, even just sort of inside our own skulls, what happens is we, we are recognizing that in some way, something outside of ourselves has created some positive benefit for us. And that's a really good thing, right? That's a really good thing. Those positive interactions, those positive experiences help reinforce our social connections, whether they are in our social environment, like our personal lives, cultural lives, or societal experiences, or in the workplace. The stronger those connections are, the better we are physically, emotionally, psychologically. We do better when we are not isolated. Human beings were not designed, are not designed to be individual creatures that live in caves with no interaction. We actually require others in our environment to varying degrees to be our best selves. And that is true literally just from biological perspective as well as psychologically. And it's certainly true in working environments. Uh, side note, one of my biggest concerns about the current trend of working from home is that we haven't adapted enough mechanisms to recreate the social connections that we desperately need. I think working from home in hybrid environments are wonderful ways for people to meet multiple needs. And humans are not designed to live in rooms by ourselves with no other contact. So I think we've really got to find ways to reinforce those connections and Workshops like this are, for example, an excellent way to do that. So gratitude internally as an experience is a powerful way to combat that sense of isolation, which is so problematic. Uh, if you haven't read the U.S. Surgeon General's report on isolation, I, I encourage you to read it, but um, it is heavy and it is, it's pretty depressing, which is kind of ironic, but it's worth understanding the impact of isolation. And isolation did not start with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've been dealing with isolation globally and certainly in the United States for a really long time. So gratitude that we experience on an internal basis helps us combat that sense of being alone because literally by default, it reminds us that we are not alone. And when we express appreciation to others, right, that external expression of gratitude, it reinforces their awareness that they're not alone too. And it be begins this really interesting psychological feedback loop of positivity. So people are already all, I uh, call it armadilloed up, they're like rolled up in little emotional balls trying to protect themselves from the universe that's this big, scary, hairy place. But when we experience gratitude and when we start to express gratitude, we're opening ourselves up to making those connections that are super duper important for us as humans. 
Now, I want to talk about happiness here because this is something that I see misused a tremendous amount of the time. So I will, I will acknowledge that the pursuit of happiness is a statement that's in the foundational documents of the American experience, the U.S. experience. And that's cool, right? But the pursuit of happiness is kind of a weird thing because the truth is happiness as an entity really isn't something you can chase. Happiness is an emotion. You can't really taste the emotion in a, in a vacuum. All emotions, all emotions are simply the way that our brain and body uh, evaluate and experience things that are going on both around us and within us. So all emotions are tremendously valid. Uh, just having happiness would be kind of ridiculous and unreal. And when we taste happiness, it's kind of like kicking the can. You're never going to actually touch it because that's not how it works. So I like to say that happiness as an emotion is really better used as a gauge of how things are going. So I'm going to ask you this rhetorical question. On a scale of one to 10, with one being the absolute worst day you can possibly imagine, and 10 being the best possible day that you could ever possibly have, where are you sitting right now, right? Where are you sitting right now? And there's no wrong answer because your reality is, is real. It is very possible that you are having a two or a three kind of a day and that's, that's real, right? There's no value judgment associated with that. When we make happiness the goal though, the problem is when we start to have those days and we will all have those two and three and even one days, honestly, because we're humans living in the real world, if our goal is happiness and we're not happy, we see ourselves as a failure. And we start this really dangerous cycle of negative self-talk. Why am I not happy? I should be happy. This, I should be feeling better than this. And it's, it's not helpful, right? Because the truth is emotions are just a dashboard for what's going on in your world. If you're having a trash day, that's real. What are you going to do about it? What can you do about it? Can you reframe your experience? Can you go for a walk? There are lots of things you maybe can do about it, or maybe you can just like grit your teeth and hope that tomorrow is better. So happiness really is better used as a measurement for how we personally are experiencing life. Now the goal is to have more seven, eight, nine, ten days than one, two, three, of course. There are seasons to life, there are experiences that are not going to lend themselves to that, and there are those that will. Recognizing what you need in this moment as a person is really valuable. In the workplace, this still applies. There is this weird uh, narrative in, for sure, the American working environment that work sucks and then you die. And work is supposed to be terrible because that's why it's called work. Now, I would argue that that is an incredibly fatalistic mindset and not incredibly helpful when it comes to living our best lives, for sure, but it's also trash when it comes to productivity. Unhappy workers do not perform well. Even if they stay with your company, God forbid they stay if they're angry, they are not the best producers, they are not the best people to be around, they are not effective at what they're doing. This research is ridiculously powerful. I'm happy to send you all the citations you want. Happier workers do better. They do better for your companies. And more importantly to me, they live better lives. The nice thing is those two things go hand in hand, right? It's not, you don't have to sacrifice having happy workers on the altar of making more money. When your employees, when your team is happy, you're going to do better. So I, I, if nothing else, I hope you take away from today that the, the idea of chasing happiness is a lost cause. You're really tilting at windmills there. Really just use your gauge of where you're sitting on your emotional scale as a benchmark for what's going on in your life. Now, there are some tools available for organizations to use to measure workplace happiness. The, the caveat is like happiness is not like a viral load, right? You can't do a cheek swab and see how many happiness units somebody's currently carrying around with them. And you can't even just do like a serotonin measure to see how much serotonin somebody's got floating around in their system. It doesn't work that way, at least not yet. The science isn't there yet. But we kind of know what it means for us to be happy and what that emotion feels like. And if we don't, there are ways to get there. 
But there are some tools that companies are using. And the one that I really like, uh, not to promote a particular organization, but there's a company in the UK called Harkin, and it's a listening platform that is designed to help organizations really understand sort of the pulse of what's going on with their workforce. Where are people at psychologically, mentally, emotionally? And how can they step in and avoid um, the explosive experiences that happen when enough people get really unhappy in the workforce? So there are some tools available. I'm happy to chat about those you know, sort of offline. Uh, but I think that a simple technique is just for leaders to talk to their people and actually care about what's going on in their spaces. So I want to wrap this section of today's conference up with some actionable strategies that we can use both as individuals and as leaders within our team to really shift the environment that we're in from that kind of stressed out, angry, unhappy space to one that's more positive and productive. And again, you'll make more money, but I don't care about that. I care that you're going to live a better life and so will your people. So the first one is really to commit to that positive mindset. One of my biggest pet peeves, biggest pet peeves, is that leadership will say to teams, you should commit to a positive mindset or a growth mindset, but their, their demeanor and their actions are anything but, right? And let's just be real. When people are evaluating their workplace landscape and they are planning their trajectory up the ladder, whatever that means for them, they're going to intuitively, subconsciously model their behavior on the people who are in charge. So whether you are in charge of a small working team or you are in, smart, in charge of a large global organization, if you are a cranky pants, that is the behavior you are going to get within your organization because you are telling people, whether you like it or not, that that is what success looks like. So if that's something you want to change, then you have to commit to being a more positive person. And it doesn't mean happy, smiley, bouncing around the office. That's that's affective happiness and that's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are an actually positive person. It's far more useful to do things like embrace a growth mindset or focus on in increasing your optimistic language and having and actually being a more optimistic person, really focusing on what could be happening that's good as opposed to always feeding your negativity bias. So commit to a positive mindset and everybody, including you, will be better. I've talked about gratitude, but I want to hit on it again because I think it's just so important. The magic of gratitude is also that our brain does not distinguish between a positive experience and remembering a positive experience. When you have a positive experience, you get that rush of neurotransmitters, hormones, feel-good chemicals in your body that create that sense of happiness, right? The dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all that good stuff. When you remember the thing that made you happy or that you're grateful for, you get another dose of all those feel-good chemicals. So it's kind of a two-for-one deal on happiness. And when you express it to somebody else, so do they. And here's a little tidbit. When people witness that happening, even if they have no idea what you're talking about and they were not part of the original experience, their brain starts to make up a story about what it might have been like. And they instinctively also get a little bit of serotonin, dopamine, and all of the feel-good chemicals. So it's kind of like a, if you're familiar with the Canadian Gallagher, it's like a splash zone of positivity just by walking through the world and expressing gratitude to people. It, it's pretty incredible. Another really key aspect to decreasing this inflammation, this friction within organizations is helping people understand how the work that they're doing is contributing to actual meaningful results. Nobody likes to feel like the energy that they're expending is wasted. And I know we're coming up on the end of the year, so this is actually really timely. You are probably at a space, or you may be in a space in your organization where you're starting to think about next year's goals. And not every organization, not every leader does a great job of this. Uh, I know I personally have very rarely had a conversation with my leadership where my goals had anything to do with anything, right? It was like, I'm going to take another class on something. Okay, I don't need any more degrees. I'm not going back to school. I'm good, right? But what are the goals that I can set that move the needle for my organization? What are the organizational goals? Do I even understand how my work is contributing to those? 
And if you're not in the sales department, you probably don't have an easy metric for understanding how what you're doing has value. So start to think about your annual goals and your people's annual goals a little bit differently. Make them meaningful, make them measurable. You know, the SMART goal uh, metric is a, is, or framework is a really great way to do that if you're not comfortable setting goals on a regular basis. But most importantly, those results have to be meaningful. They have to be meaningful to the individual and the AN, but they have to be meaningful to whatever the greater organization is that the individual is, is serving whether that's their work or their family or their community group or whatever. Results are a huge piece of job satisfaction and life satisfaction. Speaking of job and life satisfaction, again, humans are not meant to be solitary creatures. And I know we have introverts on this call. I know we have introverts who will watch the recording. I am married to an introvert. I am not suggesting that relationships mean that you have to have 300 best friends with whom you go out dancing every evening. That's not what it means. But people do better when they have those interconnected relationships. That could be with their teammates. It could be with your customer. It could be with the barista on the corner where you grab your morning coffee. It doesn't really matter where you find those relationships, but having strong relationships relationship makes the working environment less stressful, makes the it's your personal environment less stressful, and it makes us feel less, it literally makes us less isolated, not just feel less isolated, it makes us less isolated. So how can you create spaces for yourself and others to start to build those relationships? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to go bowling after work or whatever. You can find ways in your daily environment to just get to know people as people and not just job descriptions. And here's the other piece of that, right? In the diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging space, we talk about this a lot. It is really easy to start to other or dehumanize somebody when you don't see them as a full human. It's a lot harder to ignore somebody else's needs when you see them as a human, just like you walking through the universe. So get to know them to the point that you're both comfortable. You know, do they have a significant other? Do they have a pet? What's their favorite flavor of pie? Like, what are the little things that make you a human? What are you comfortable sharing about yourself in these, in these spaces that make you more than just a cog in a machine? Because you're not, you're a person. And we're all very interesting and very worthy of experiencing positive working environments and life in general. And finally, don't wait for the big stuff to celebrate. You know, I've worked on projects that were like 10 or 12 years long, and I've seen people join these projects and spend a tremendous amount of energy and time and sweat and tears and never see the results. And there are lots of opportunities to pause and celebrate the milestones, the effort that people are putting in. Look for those opportunities to find the small wins. You know, in life, we have these peak experiences where things feel pretty fancy. We find the perfect house. We get the awesome promotion. We make tenure. Whatever that looks like in your world, those peak experiences are amazing, but they don't happen all the time. That's okay. What does? What's happening on a daily or weekly basis that we can pause, acknowledge, and appreciate? Because those little boosts of positivity will help smooth out the friction that's going to inevitably happen because we are people in an imperfect world, good with other people, we're also in an imperfect world. So I'm gonna pause here because I think that there are lots of people on this call who also have really amazing thoughts and I'm curious to hear where you're at with inflammation and what your idea is on how we can make this better. Um, Sarah, Thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask a few questions that came to my mind on the assumption that they probably came to the mind of other people. Everybody else, if you have a question, please write it down in the chat um, and we'll be asking them on your behalf. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the last thought first and then work my way back to the little notes. Um, when you brought up celebrating things, A, totally on board, but I'd like you to kind of explain how that's different from gratitude, because to me, that would be a subset of gratitude. I think that's a really good point, right? I think when you're celebrating, you are engaging in a flavor, a form of gratitude. I mean, the reality is you are saying, I am appreciative of this moment. 
But I think there's a difference between pausing to say, hey, Jen, thank you so much for helping me with that project. That was really helpful. And saying, woohoo, I'm bringing coffee to the office because something really cool happened. Jen got the recording to start on time. Woohoo. You know, like that, there's a different energy level that comes with that. And we don't make time in our world to pause and do those like boosts mood boosters, essentially. And so a celebration doesn't have to be uh, all expensive just paid trip to Hawaii. It could be just somebody being cooking to the office to recognize somebody's birthday. But it, it is still a moment of, a, of an elevated experience that, and it could be, um, I think it could be for any number of about a bazillion things. Right. I, I like that approach. You know, I, I was at a Hindi temple once and people, I was watching just person after person after person bringing the car in for a blessing. And when I asked the priest about it, he said, oh, it's it's basically cosmetic, right? There's nothing magical about breaking a coconut or driving over three lines, but there is a need, people have a need for public acknowledgement yep. of whatever it is. You bought a car, you want someone other than your immediate family to say good job. <laughs> so, um, okay, so next question has to do and again if you have questions please write them in the chat and we'll start asking them on your behalf the next question i had have i love the idea of happiness as a gauge and not a goal because like anybody who chases happiness is probably not going to be very happy but you can in on reflection go yeah that made me pretty happy um but i did have a question for people who are you know clinically depressed maybe they're on medication to control anxiety or depression or whatever it is you know the high, whole idea of being positive might be a real burden for certain people who could be really productive, but you know they're going to be those little unhappy faces in the amusement park, whether or not the amusement park is letting them on the ride. Yeah, that's really that's a really good point, and I think that speaks to the cultural definition of happiness, right? It's kind of like what does success look like for you? If if you allow the greater society to determine what your happiness or your success should should look like, you're probably in trouble. So I believe that figuring out what that looks like for you is going to be super important. That's why I don't really appreciate when people say you don't look happy, right? Uh, Martin Seligman does some really interesting work on the concept of positivity, and he sort of defines it in two, two different axes. One is the affectation, like do you look, seem, jolly, merry, upbeat? That is, that's a scale, yes or no, right? And there's a lot, lot in between. And it's very culturally specific. A, a, a little side story here. I invited some friends to join a webinar hosted by the Action for Happiness group out of the UK. And they do some amazing work on happiness and positivity. And they don't look traditionally happy when they're speaking a lot of times. I think there's a cultural difference in how people just manifest emotions. And my, my friends were like, that was not a very happy environment. And I was like, did you even listen to the content? It was super powerful and super positive. You just put a layer over it of your expectation of how happiness should look. So that's a piece of it. The other angle that Seligman talks about is cognitive optimism, right? Like, so how do you think about the world? Is the world a deep, dark, horrible place? Or is the world a bright, shining place full of opportunity? Or where in between do you sit? And we all on that sort of access, we all sit somewhere as a sort of a default. We can shift that over time with effort. But for people who do have like chemical situations or life situations that are absolutely terrible, it is unrealistic to say you should be out in the streets dancing all the time. So what works for you? And maybe your goal isn't to be that, maybe your goal shouldn't be to be a uh, super happy dancing Sarah, but it should be to be content in your space for right now. I think having that honest conversation with yourself and if you're in that space with like a care provider on how to navigate that so that you don't wind up having the negative emotions sort of uh, grind away at you is, is a really positive way to approach that. So I wanna follow up with that. Like say you're a manager and you're working with someone who does have a clinical depression problem and you're working on trying to improve, you know, the, get rid of the inflammation, but you, you don't just have an Eeyore, right? <laughs> um, you know, I, I was thinking, and I'm specifically thinking, I don't know if you've seen the Robbie Williams documentary on Netflix, but his depression and suicidal behavior kind of interfered with his original group. 
right? And they didn't know what was going on with him to be able to work with that, right? And it took decades of this man's life to get to a point where he got the right meds and wasn't self-medicating mm-hmm. and stuff. But it interfe- it can interfere with work. So what is the advice for a manager who's trying to create a more positive work environment and do gratitude and celebrate and show people that their work matters when they have an employee? How do they not discriminate? Yeah, that's such a hard stuff, person. right? Yeah, that's really good. Well, I think, you know, just to, to add, like Robin Williams is a great example of somebody who was uh, outwardly super happy and we all know was absolutely internally not, right? So, so when you're a manager in that situation, I think there are a couple of things. So obviously you want to be really careful of whatever laws are present in your space and making not making assumptions. One of the challenges I see with these conversations is people are super uncomfortable having conversations about stuff that's uncomfortable. So get a copy of Crucial Conversations or watch a couple of webinars on how to have those difficult talks and let go of your expectation that your team is going to be a bunch of Pollyannas who are always chipper and upbeat. I mean, people bring their their whole selves to the workplace and sometimes part of their whole self is clinical depression or anxiety or social awkwardness or any number, neurodiversity of, of many flavors. So I think some awareness on the part of the manager is probably super helpful. And I think having realistic expectations of what the ecosystem of your team looks like and what this group together can can do both in an environmental sense, like what is the what is the temperature of our team environment look like? How do we appropriately work with each other? Emotional intelligence is going to be super useful in this space for the manager and probably for everybody else on that team too. But, you know, your team is probably looking for some professional development content anyway. And wouldn't it be nice to do emotional intelligence instead of, I don't know, two truths and a lie? So I think there are some resources out there that are really useful in this space. Yeah. And do you know of any situations where there has been a clinically depressed person who has been supported who they are without getting themselves fired? Right? In America? No. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it exists, but I, I don't see it. But I do think this conversation is happening. I think mental right. health is on the forefront of many people's uh, radar. And I think we are seeing a, a recognition that it is a more complex landscape and it is not just a matter of somebody being uh, weak-willed or whatever. I think we are seeing a, a stretching of awareness of what normal really means. And and I think as we see... Uh, people who have been raised in an environment that has more acceptance of mental health and all of its variety, that we're going to see some shift in management styles as well. Fingers crossed. Great. Because I always think of Eeyore and they didn't require Eeyore to be anybody other than Eeyore and they still included him, right? That's the ideal. Um, Do we have questions? We do have some questions. Um, we'll start off with John Moores. Um, he mentioned that um, they have weekly pride check-ins at work. Um, they're important for building community. Uh, what could we do to introduce more gratitude in positivity into our check-ins? Well, first of all, what I would say is don't make it obligatory, right? Um, performative gratitude is not gratitude. It is an obligation. It's kind of like, tell grandma, thank you for those ugly socks that you hate. Okay, that is not really gratitude. That is just saying words that you don't actually mean. So I think introducing the concept of gratitude and positivity as a desired state, as a desired piece of your environment is going to be really helpful. And then make space for it. You know, is I don't know if the check-in is necessarily the right spot for that because honestly, honestly, it can feel like it's a high pressure situation and people start to uh, parrot out the same stuff. You know, mm. it's like when you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table here in the States and the people go around, I'm thankful for my family. Are you? Because you don't seem very happy right now. So but I think maybe the check-in itself is not the right place for it, but is there another channel by which you can create space for gratitude and positivity to exist? I I know a lot of companies are using Microsoft Teams or Slack, and that is a great way to create like a a kudos channel. People can start to pop in. Hey, John, I really appreciate your help with that project. It made my life so much easier. Or, hey, Elizabeth, I love your blazer. You look so cool today. Like just little things like that and frame it as, as, you know, a positive thing, not mandatory because mandatory gratitude is not, is neither good or desirable. But I think you have to say that you want this to happen. And then it's it's like any other change management process, just encourage people to do it, model the behavior you want to see. 
Uh, you can incentivize it sometimes. I've seen people, I have seen organizations, anybody who gets mentioned in a kudo gets dropped into a drawing for you know, some nominal token or even just a shout out on social media. So there are, there are some ways like that. And I have some other ideas, John. So I will think about this and I will drop you an email. Um, can I follow up on that? Um, yeah. One of the, the faith traditions have different, they're obviously weekly, right? But the UU, which is what I'm most familiar with, one of the things they do at the beginning of their service is they share joys and sorrows, right? That there's an opportunity, you don't have, it's not an opportunity to be happy. It's okay to come in with sorrow. Yeah. Right. And to have the community acknowledge whatever either state and support you through either state, I think as a human feels much better than a, okay, what good happened to you this week? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I think, and you know, obviously there's always a fear that if you open that space, people will, the Eeyore will come in and dominate that space. And then you get to have the conversation off the side and say, Hey, you know, I see you're having a hard time. How can I help? Um, yeah, so I am. I agree with you about the, the shout out, um, you know, at, at the right time. I just shared a link um, when I was at Arizona State University. They had a really great program called the Sun Award. And you and it was all an online system where you could give a shout out to somebody and then they got a certificate. It's all digital. Um, it was all automated. And then their boss got a copy of it. And it, it made you feel so good when you got one. So, John, I thought maybe that could be a good model. Uh, for you. Um, let's go to the next question then, because um, Marty had one too. Let's uh, see that um, some companies are stopping their annual empl uh, employee reviews, as many have reported they are stressful and negative. Um, is there a model that works better that you can recommend, or should it just be um, spontaneous and not structured? I wish that we lived in a world where people could be relied upon to engage in spontaneous and unstructured feedback and you know guidance. I don't think we're there yet, uh, but I would agree that I have yet to see an organization do a bang up job of annual reviews. And Marcus Buckingham has some really interesting thoughts around the feedback process. And the truth is, we none of us do a great job of of giving feedback because we're all it's all based on a lot of assumptions that we have just subconsciously. So do I think that there's a place for it in the system? I think that there is still a space. And if organizations are going to, and they do, monetize your performance based on some arbitrary performance review, then I think we have to have that. But I do think that there needs to be, that, that goes back to that goal setting thing, right? Why are, tech, why are annual reviews so stressful? Because you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You're not sure how you're measuring up and you walk into this thing always feeling like you're in a bad space. And that's true for the employee and the manager. It's never, it never feels good to engage in an annual review. So do a better job, like do a better job of, of sharing expectations, do a better job of doing regular check-ins before you get to that once a year, big, meaningful conversation. It's... To me, it feels like your annual review really should be almost like um, an afterthought. If you don't know how things are going until you walk into that room or sign into that Zoom call, your leadership has failed you because you shouldn't be caught by surprise and what's going on. So I think companies need to approach this conversation differently. I'd like to see them provide more structure around how managers and leaders do these reviews. Um, but I, I like to see more support and structure for managers in just about everything that managers are expected to do. And I think we do not we we do our all of our managers a disservice by not providing them enough interpersonal skills. They may be a really good accountant, but they're a really terrible accounting manager. And that's just real. Yeah, uh, good point. Um, what about, you know, the periodic check-ins, just more, uh, I, I also think it's ridiculous that companies just do once a year performance yeah. reviews, like what's up with that um, versus like quarterly or every other? I month? love it. I think, I think we, it's kind of like a Valentine's Day card, right? Like if you have to wait for your spouse or your partner to tell you that they love you for Valentine's Day, ooh, maybe you need counseling. But, but right, it is a reminder in a really busy world to pause and do a thing. So I think that quarterly or even monthly check-ins are probably better. I also know that in many organizations, leaders have way too many direct reports for that to be functional. So that's the conversation we need to be having as well. But I think that I think that 
we have to make space and it's you, sometimes you just have to schedule the things that are important, right? I mean, that's just real. Um, and I'm going to go to a couple of questions that Esperanza um, asked. Um, for, be, first of all, she had asked um, in her registration question about is there data on happiness for other countries, Venezuela being of special interest to her. Uh, but it also got to me like should intercultural um, awareness, you know, how, how is this translating universally or do are there cultural caveats? Yes. So yes, yes, and yes. So there is quite a bit of research. Uh, the Gallup organization puts out a report every year on the state of the work for, workforce, and they have various uh, ways that they splice the data, including research on individual regions and countries within those regions. So I think that's really helpful to look at. Um, I'm personally mostly focused on personally focused on the Mexican data because I have some business connections in Mexico, so we have these conversations regularly. But there is research available on unique geographic locations and uh, longitudinally, right? So year over year, happiness, stress, workforce engagement, all of those sorts of things. And I think it's not really Comparison is the thief of joy, as, as the quote goes. And I think it's dangerous for us to say, well, the global standard is X and therefore you are terrible because you are Y. But it is helpful to see culturally how my space is doing whatever my space looks like. So I would definitely encourage checking out Gallup research. And then um, Action for Happiness has some research available at actionforhappiness.org. And the American Psychological Association also frequently publishes uh, research on different regional uh, stress levels and happiness amongst their zillion other topics that they present on. And I think uh, the University of Berkeley also has, the Greater Good Center also has some pretty good resources that are globally focused. Um, thank you. So Esperanza also brought up a good point about um, the importance of vulnerability, um, recognizing it as part of life, um, not as an obstacle, but as an impulse. So, uh, you know, do you have comments about vulnerability in the workplace? Yeah, so it, it's a hard topic because it's a, I, I believe holistically vulnerability is important for us to make real connections with other people. I also am not so naive to imagine that vulnerability isn't isn't literally what it says, a vulnerability, right? So I think we are starting to see some conversations. I think Brene Brown has done some incredible work in this space. I think corporations like to talk about psychological safety as a buzzword, but they are doing uh, a mixed bag of performance when it comes to creating spaces where psychological safety can actually exist. Uh, but that's why, these, that's why these kinds of conversations are so important because each of us can can sort of reinforce the need for that. Vulnerability is crucial though, for us to be able to connect as humans. It just also creates an automatic, you know, vulnerability. Um, thank you. Uh, you. You said something at the beginning of the presentation that really struck a chord with me, and that was the idea about how if organizations keep a fearful workplace, it's a way of controlling employees. And I do wonder how much of that is um, subconscious or just baked into, you know, like the capitalistic way of, you know, and so what does humanistic capitalism look like? Um, do you have thoughts about that or seen any companies who have been able to make that that shift to get out of that um, fear and domination mindset? Reminds me a lot of the Rianne Eisler work, right? The partner moving from partnership to domination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, do, I, well, I have lots of thoughts. Most of them are not printable in public company. I think we see the Henry Ford model of leadership as um, a change in the way that American companies, and I think we influenced a lot of global, global organizational leadership as a result. And it was absolutely fear-based, right? To the point of having people beholden to the company store. Like these concepts are not new, uh, but they are trash and we, we can do better. So I think that, I, every time I see somebody stand up and say, this is not acceptable. And I'm, what I do see is that my Generation Z colleagues are changing the narrative around this. And I am incredibly grateful for their bravery and willingness to carry that banner because it is a conversation that needs to happen. You know, change is hard. Cultural change is incredibly hard and workplace culture is, is difficult to shift. It's often referred to as fearing the Titanic, right? And it can be done, right? It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of solidarity and a lot of consistency. So I think that when we when we can encourage people who are willing to have those conversations, when we don't 
fire people for asking those kinds of questions, when we don't penalize people for asking those kinds of questions, we create spaces for more of these conversations to happen. Um, and I, I really do think that humanistic capitalism is, is a concept that needs to be more in the forefront because for too long, the measure of success was the profit margin. And that, that's the problem with that is it didn't take any other variables into consideration. Humans all work in companies, right? Like all companies have humans working for them, even ones with lots of automation and AI. So if you are not considering the human impact and the human factor, you are, you're ignoring a huge chunk of the algorithm and shame on you and silly you for not being aware of the actual variables affecting your performance. So I think we can have more of these. I think we will be having more of these conversations because I believe we've squeezed about as much blood out of the turnip as we can. And companies are recognizing that things are not great and they're not getting better. So they're more open to having novel conversations on this topic. Um, yeah, Sarah, I agree with you so much. And uh, that's why I'm such an advocate for social accounting as a way to get some of these intangible metrics on the performance and KPI um, indicators, you know, employee Absolutely. engagement, culture, uh, those kind of things. Um, and I wanted to also uh, mention a comment Esperanza had shared um, because it's a, a thing about how project management, especially the agile method, does have celebration built into its project cycle. Um, and so I think that's an excellent model of, you know, uh, how companies can authorize uh, happiness and celebration in the workplace, uh, building on those kind of practices. Yeah, I think I, I'm always excited to see these frameworks that uh, intentionally or otherwise, like wrap these concepts in. So I'm, I'm all about finding opportunities to weave it in where we can, you know, there are so many, so many opportunities. Uh, and then Marty shared another resource about um, past research from the National Happiness Survey shows certain cultures report happiness and positivity more than other cultures, regardless of what's happening uh, in that country. Uh, for example, Hispanic cultures share positive feelings, uh, while Russian companies have very negative reports, regardless of their success. Uh, so culture, you know, is a determinant. Um, and then I see you put a comment. There's a theory that Spanish as a language requires more of the muscle movements that trigger dopamine. That's pretty, uh, so the physiological connection. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's something that has not really been explored up until very recently. And I am very excited to see some more of that research come out on the literal biological physiological intersection. Well, yes. um, we have, just real quick, we have about five minutes left um and there's a couple of questions that showed up in the original question in the original list that we got from when people signed up that i think are worth kind of diving into um the first one is that sometimes pain can be positive and lead to new solutions so what are what are and are there tolerable limits to misery as a motivation a like a positive motivational force Yes, I think that that leads to the conversation around like you stress versus distress. Not all stress is created equal. Some stress is absolutely necessary for us to literally get out of bed and to be productive. The challenge comes when organizations see that a little bit of chaos or panic can lead to good performance. And so they're like, well, if a little panic worked well, let's just pour it on in heavy doses. Uh, long term, that will lead to burnout and worse outcomes. So the, the If you've seen the York Dodson performance curve on stress and motivation, I think it speaks to that exact concept. Uh, and again, right, this also goes back to that conversation around we, if you're always trying to be happy and positive, then that's probably going to dissuade you from those spaces where stress, discomfort, even true agony and pain are a part of the conversation. I mean, I have four kids, I would say giving birth is a not necessarily positive experience, but it leads to some incredible outcomes, right? So what are the what is the metaphor for that in business? There is a time and a place for us to just buckle down and deal with stuff. That cannot be the norm. It is the norm, and that's why burnout is such a catastrophic problem. Yeah, that makes sense. Not it should not be the norm. <laughs> that's the key, right? It should not be the norm. Um, okay, so the the final question I want to ask out of those but out of the, the pre-questions was finding motivation as an individual when you're struggling with this. We talked about dealing with this organizationally and as a, in a leadership position, but how does 
as an individual find the motivation to even tackle this when you have a low? Like what if something like your parents just died and you've got three months of this, how do you cope? Should you cope? Should you give yourself the space? What is your recommendation? Well, you should definitely be authentic about what your emotional state is and not try to become a Stepford wife, right? So pretending that things are fine when they're not is just repressing emotions. And again, if emotions are guiding us to make the appropriate decision about our environment, then we need to know what those actual emotions are. So practicing some emotional literacy and some emotional intelligence for ourselves is going to be a piece of that. When things get hairy, I think we have to find a support system. Maybe that looks like professional support, like a counselor, a doctor, a therapist, support group. I mean, there are lots of those sorts of avenues. Maybe it looks like an informal support group, like a best friend or a social group. I personally have a regular weekly Zoom call with some friends that is invaluable, and I schedule my life around that because it's so important to me. And it is not a, it's not always happiness and joy. I mean, we're kind of all fearful, fearful tipper folks, but the truth is we bring heavy topics to that group too, because the level of trust is so strong that it's a safe environment to get that support. You know, this is why community is so important. Humans are not meant to be solitary creatures and we will all go through ebbs and flows in our energy, our excitement, our joy, our sorrows. The likeliness of all of us going through all the same stuff at the same time is virtually none. So when I'm having a trash day, if you're having a good day, you can step in and be that sort of person to carry the torch forward, recognizing that we as a group, much like John's pride group, we have committed to supporting each other as a group. So if I'm having a bad day and you're not, cool, today it's your turn to carry the torch, recognizing that you will have the day where it's not your turn and it's my turn instead. So build your network, build your support network, nurture those relationships because it's not a one and done. You're not like, okay, we're friends now, the end. No, it's we're friends. How do I support you? How do you support me? And how do we all mutually benefit from this space? I mean, I think that's that's about as humanistic as anything, right? Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. Um, so we're almost done. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining um, us today. And, um, you know, if you like what you see and you want to get more involved, the International Humanistic Management Association is an association of members, um, and we encourage you to join. Um, and Elizabeth, I don't, I didn't pull up the uh, membership language. So if you have that, if you can find it real quick. I'm looking for it. In the chat. Um, Sarah, do you have any last thoughts to leave us with? You know, I know this is weird and hard and contrary to at least American culture and certainly other parts of the of the world as well. So my final thought is you're not alone in this, right? Like we are all navigating a complicated environment. So reach out, for, for sure connect with me. I, I tend to be on Seligman's scale, the more affective, positive person, but I also do like to talk about this stuff and provide encouragement. So connect with me and I'm not trying to do a sales pitch. Let's be friends, right? Like I would like to support you on your journey to a more positive environment for yourself and your team. And connect with people who you know have similar goals, like join the groups, be a member of, of any organization that helps provide a more positive, meaningful experience for you. But again, you're not alone and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Again, this is the International Humanistic Management Association's Lunch and Learn, where we were talking about organizational inflammation and how to combat that. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. And uh, we hope everybody enjoyed this and gets involved with the organization. <laughs>